who is Alex of Alberta's Project and why should we care? But I lost my best friend about a year and a half ago, and she was just an amazing, amazing person. I knew she was struggling. I really didn't know much. I was very much in the mind of, oh, she's been to rehab. It just, you know, it's a cure, right? Very, very uneducated. When I lost her, I realized how misinformed I was on so many levels, both personally, but I just felt like society kind of failed me and I didn't know how to help my friend. I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have said the right thing. I felt a lot of, a lot of a different emotions, but um, I found out that while she was struggling, she was actually successfully helping other people in their recovery journey. So I knew that I needed to do something. So no other best friend had to sort of go through what I was going through. Um, I started the Albertus Project really, it was really just a way for me to grieve and for me to cope and and to find a way um, that I could make a difference uh, and continue on the good work that she was doing. So at a very high level, it was uh, it was a passion project and now has turned into being able to help hundreds of people, um, both in Canada where Reed and I are from, but also in the United States where I now reside. Welcome to the Family Addiction Coaching Podcast. My name is Patrick Doyle. I am one of only 22 certified craft clinicians in the United States, a family addiction coach, and a social worker with 30 years experience in the addiction and mental health fields. From this series, you'll learn insider tips and strategies to best help a loved one with addiction gain health and recovery. You will also learn how to improve your family's overall quality of life. Let's get started. Today, I am so honored and pleased to be talking with my good friend, Alex Collier, who has so much wisdom and experience to share. Alex, thank you for coming onto the show. How are you today, Alex? I'm really good and very excited to be here. It's actually, it's neat, Patrick, with with how we met on Twitter and everything. You were one of the first podcasts when I started getting into this space that I started listening to. And it was nice and it was different because I felt like I could learn real valuable, like kind of take home knowledge. It wasn't just an opinion based and I love opinion based podcasts, but I felt like I was really getting something out of it. So I feel like it's kind of a full circle now being on here. So thanks for the opportunity. I'm so glad to hear that the information is useful for someone. So you just made my day, Alex. (laughs) Once in a while, I will swing into like editorializing or opinion mode, but I try to be really careful that I'm saying this is just my observation kind of thing as opposed to science. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I'm wicked psyched about this. this is really exciting. Please, if you would share with our audience, who is Alex of Alberta's Project? And why should we care? Yeah, sure. So as you said, my name is Alex Collier. I run a nonprofit called the Albertus Project. If you ever told me two years ago, a year and a half ago, I would be in this space, I would tell you you're crazy and I'd have nothing to do with running a nonprofit, never mind centered around addiction. But I lost my best friend about a year and a half ago, and she was just an amazing, amazing person. I knew she was struggling. I really didn't know much. I was very much in the mind of, oh, she's been to rehab. It just, you know, it's a cure, right? Very, very uneducated. When I lost her, I realized how misinformed I was on so many levels, both personally, but I just felt like society kind of failed me and I didn't know how to help my friend. I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have said the right thing. I felt a lot of, a lot of different emotions, but Um, I found out that while she was struggling, she was actually successfully helping other people in their recovery journey. So I knew that I needed to do something. So no other best friend had to sort of go through what I was going through um, and also honor the good work that my friend Reed was doing. So um, I started the Albertus Project really, um, and I think we'll talk a little bit about the mission, but um, it was really just a way for me to grieve and for me to cope and and to find a way um, that I could make a difference uh, and continue on the good work that she was doing. So at a very high level, it was uh, it was a passion project and now has turned into being able to help hundreds of people, um, both in Canada, where Reed and I are from, but also in the United States, where I now reside. So it sounds like a, a memorial. A hundred percent. It it really was. It started out like that. Um, and me being able to sort of find purpose and in, in loss. 
um, and now it's turned into something greater with the support of so many people. So I'm just, I'm stoked about it. Yeah, that's awesome. So channeling your grief, pain and loss and disbelief, channeling that into this Alberta's project was a way for you to honor not only her memory and what she meant to so many people, but also move forward for you yourself. Yeah, no. And and that's the thing, you know, as much as I wanted to help other people, I I was, I remember she passed in in January, uh, 2021. And um, it would actually happen to be the day of the Capitol riots. And it was just a crazy story and whatever. I mean, that whole day was just oh, awful. My goodness. It was, yeah, not a good day uh, at all. But I, I spent months trying to like look online and, you know, ha- how could family and friends help? What resources are there for family and friends? Like, I, I need to get my bearings. Like, I sort of need to understand what happened. And when I went to online, I, I found it so difficult to just get the basic information I needed. When I would go to one website, it would say something. And I go to another website, it'd say something completely different. And I'm like, why Why is that? Why can't I just search what I would think is a simple question? Like, is addiction genetic? Um, you know, I heard about a term called harm reduction. I'm like, is harm reduction effective, right? I go to one website, it says saves lives. I go to, you know, an NA or AA website, it would say that it's quite harmful to someone's recovery journey. And I, I couldn't get a straight answer. So for me, not only was it like a therapeutic thing and a way to honor my friend, but I realized if I'm feeling this way and I feel so confused and conflicted, frankly, about my positioning on things that the rest of the general public is also not getting the information, the adequate information that they need that's not stigmatized or not misinformed or framed one way or another. And that's where it sort of comes to the mission of the Albertus Project, where um, our, our mission is read after my friend Reed, but the first part is to redefine the way that the world views addiction from one of blame and shame to one of compassion and support. And that really, all that gets to is the fact that the way that we view people with addiction is completely different than the way that we view people with cancer or diabetes. And there, listen, there's, there's some differences, but at the end of the day, can you imagine being a family member or a friend of someone dealing with cancer and you just like kick them out of their house and don't talk to them and blame them? Like that, that's the type of stuff that I was like, holy moly. Like I, I never thought about it like that. I originally thought that addiction was a choice. And then I went through all this data and realized that that, that wasn't the case. But I, I just started slowly going through each of the things that I was going to say fed as a kid, right? Mm-hmm. Doing drugs is bad. People who do drugs are bad. Don't associate with those people. Um I also kind of, you know, support the federal government as a contractor. That's my other job. I have a clearance. I'm not allowed to be around that stuff. And for some reason, I sort of felt high and mighty that I never engaged in that. And that's just the way that society sort of rewards people and punishes others. And that that's a little bit about the mission. Just I started realizing the way that we were taught family and friends um, especially to like kind of throw these people out on the street and not lend their support and that you are part of the problem and these family and friends feel so much blame and shame. I mean, I know I did and I can only imagine that was a, a hundredth of what my friend felt. Yeah. One question that comes to mind is how do you decide when you're seeing conflicting reports or information, how do you make sense of it? How do you decide what is reliable and what isn't? That's a good question. And and that was something that took me an immense amount of time. One thing that I sort of pride myself in doing, I, I, I think there's actually an advantage of being, so I'm going to say an outsider to this community, because I would say that um, people within it are steadfast in what they believe, which is, which is great. But at the end of the day, I find it, it's very hard to sway people, right? Just in general, never mind this community. When someone thinks a particular way, uh, they're less likely to change it. So it started with me 
thinking I knew everything about addiction. It's someone's fault that the war on drugs made sense, that we need to stop people using, that if we decriminalize drugs, somehow this is going to get better. You know, all, all this stuff. And now my view is 180. So what yeah. I did is I went online and I, no, no kidding, looked at the research. I looked at the data and I would type in what I thought would be correct and I go through scholarly articles. And I'll tell you, that is exactly part of the reason why one of the mission of uh, the Albertus Project is to educate the public is because who the heck has time to go through these scholarly articles? It should not be that difficult to get the answers to my questions, right? It just shouldn't be. So I spent, I mean, you can ask my, my husband and my family, days, weeks, sifting through immense amount of information, both that was against what I thought and then eventually f what I thought was accurate. And it was, it was so simple to see that what I thought was accurate, there was no data to support it. And it was, it ended up being quite simple. Again, I had to go through all that data, but that's part of the reason why the Albertus Project provides, I call them one-on-one resources, where if you only have five minutes, you can go on our website, you can go under resources and read, what is harm reduction? You know, what are some of the warning signs of addiction? how to support a family member or friend. And um, as a young person myself, I use social media to my advantage. I think about the fact that before I lost my friend, I didn't you know, know anything about addiction. And, and I think about it because I spent a, a lot of time besides my job on social media. No one's posting about addiction. It's not, it's not a fun topic, right? It's not right. interesting. Right. So I've tried to leverage the information that I'm learning, use real data, put it into a cool, fun, graphic that people are going to yeah. see and be like, oh, I'm going to take three seconds to just read this. And it'll start getting in their head. Oh, okay. So that that's what, that's what addiction is. Okay. It's a disease. Even if it's three minutes, it starts getting in people's heads and subconsciously that changes the minds of people. So that's, that's sort of a technique I've been using. Right. If we talk about the Albertus Project's mission, that might be redefining the world's perspective on addiction. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, it's it's changing it from one of realizing that not everything that, you know, th these people are demonized as like uh, they have chosen this life and just like for I'm very outspoken, the fact that I have anxiety. My God, if someone told me that I've chosen to have anxiety and just to stop being anxious, I would, I would go crazy. We don't, right. we don't do that to people. You know, yeah. 20, 30 years ago, we might have. And we realize how inappropriate that is. No doctor is going to tell me anymore. Well, just stop being anxious. So why do we have even doctors now telling, oh, stop using it? It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. People want, no one wakes up who's dealing with addiction being, oh, I want this life. No one wants it. So we need to figure out, you know, okay, we're not going to blame these people. Um, we are going to support them to whatever recovery journey makes the most sense for them. Yeah. Awesome. If we could like real concisely go through the remaining sure. three parts of the mission, we've got empower those suffering. We've got educate, well, educate the public. I think you covered that. And we've got destigmatize addiction. Yeah, exactly. So empowering, that was something that was really important to me because my friend, I'm sure like everyone else felt very ashamed of, of their use. And, and I just... I want to be a huge advocate for these people. These are some of the greatest people you'll ever meet. They have desires and they have talents and they're kind and you know like it's it's about humanizing these people. So the Albertus project provides a wide range of support, but I'll just sort of name a couple of how we try to empower them. First is is by um making sure that they feel sort of human and taken care of. So we have something called Humans of Addiction. Um, which takes after Humans of New York. Um, we have people from all over the country and Canada send in their story uh, about either their recovery journey or them being in active addiction or whatever. Typically, they're inspiring stories. And I didn't find that there was a way that these people felt like they were empowered. So that's just one example of they have an amazing story and I want to give them sort of the platform to be able to share it. Um, but a couple of the other things that we do is you know, a lot of people end up in jail. A lot of people go to rehab. They don't have funds. They don't have money when they get out of whatever circumstances it might be. And they're trying to start the recovery journey. 
that's tough because how are you supposed to start your recovery journey without kind of basic necessities? So right. we have a grant from Walmart that allows us to give back to the addiction and recovery community, help pay for food, um, help pay for you know furniture if they need it, clothing for their kids. No one should have to feel like uh, they're not able to support themselves and how difficult recovery is, period, never mind without that. Um, we also provide money for transportation to and from treatment centers. One thing I learned is how difficult uh, treatment can be just in terms of money, but also getting there. Uh, so that's one thing. And then another thing that we do is pay for medication-assisted treatment proven to be incredibly effective in so many areas, but most importantly, reducing risk of overdoses. So that is, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that we're lowering barriers to entry so no one feels, you know, if someone wakes up and wants to start their recovery journey, that that is not one barrier. So that's the empower piece. And then the destigmatize piece, that's everything that I wake up getting excited to do. I held a lot of stigma I know that if I can change the way that I view things, I know that others can too. I hope that yeah. it doesn't take as something as dramatic as what happened in my life for people to wake up and be like, whoa, like this, this, you know, I didn't lose a friend. I didn't lose a family member. Thank God. But like, this is, this is my job as a human just to understand the situation and respect people um, and try to be supportive when I can. So it's destigmatizing. And really, that goes back hand in hand with the education piece, providing people the information, unbiased, unfiltered, um, and at the end of the day, letting them make their own determination on whether they choose to accept it or not. Yeah, that's awesome. And the financial support that you're able to provide, thanks to Walmart, et cetera, is just amazing. We never think about that. Like you said, the cost of participating in treatment. Yeah, it's um, so expensive. It's, yeah. it's it's awful. And that should never, like, can you imagine, like, and I mean, I think about, you know, I'm, I'm from Toronto, Canada. It's even expensive there. It's not, you know, it's not just a you, you, we take for granted. I'll tell you, I had a car. My dad bought me a car before I had a license. I never even thought twice. When I when I came into the space and was speaking to treatment centers, I, I did sort of like I spoke to treatment centers all over the country. I said, I have money from donors who have been so generous. What do you need? And they told me what they needed, what their people needed. And that was, hey, they can't afford their medicine. And I was like, okay, great, great, sign me up. And they're like, also, Alex, they can't afford their transportation. So, for example, in West Virginia, people are typically paying 80 bucks a day just to get to and from their treatment center because their opioid treatment center that dispenses, for example, their methadone is like an hour away. And that's wow. each, each way. So yeah. people should not have to worry about being able to access good care. That should just be a human right. You're right. Absolutely. Now, it seems one fascinating aspect of the Alberta's project is that whereas most advocacy groups are either supporting persons with addiction, mm -hmm. maybe there are a handful that are supporting families, but we don't see many bridging those two yeah. populations. But it seems like Alberta's project is bridging that gap by supporting both patients and families. What yeah. is it that you're seeing that so many might be missing? Yeah, no, and and that's a good point. Honestly, when I went, just think about starting a nonprofit. I I did my research because I was like, there are so many organizations that are doing just such badass work. But I went online, and I'm like, I'm a friend. Why can't I find resources for me? Like, what you know, God forbid, if a mom or a dad or a sister has to deal with this stuff, like. What's the stuff for them, right? I'm I'm so grateful that so many organizations are reaching the addiction community, but what about all the family members and friends who are left out, either purposely or not, by this process, and they're still suffering in their own right too? And they, they I I know how helpless it feels, you know. So I yeah. realized, okay, there's a real gap in this space that I feel like I can fill. Um, and I have to tell you, well, a half of the job is supporting the, the addiction community directly, you know, whether that's folks in active addiction, folks in recovery, people in recovery for 20 years, whatever that is. The other half that I, I pride myself in is being a resource for family and, and friends. Um, and this is how you and I met because I was just, I'm like, when family and friends are reaching out to me, which is, I'm going to say weekly, if not more than that. I don't, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm not a trained professional. 
And then I started doing research and I found um, craft community reinforcement and family uh, training and that just rocked my world. And that is something that everyone needs to know about. Um, and that's something that uh, the Albertus Project is actually helping to pay for, for family members and friends who can't afford the, you know, the training itself. But I just wanted to figure out how can we dip into and fu- and fulfill sort of the other half of the equation. I always sort of equate it to you're on an airplane um, and they always say, you know, if the oxygen mass drop, you right. got to put on yours before you got to put on someone else's. How the heck are our parents or cousins or whatever it is supposed to support their their family members when they're never given the skills? And I'll tell you, that the way that the current, uh, you know, treatment centers and traditional addiction treatment is set up, they're like blamed and they're, they're either blamed or they're just not allowed to be part of the process or frankly, both. Uh, yeah. That makes no sense to me. It, it clinically does not help anyone. Um, and I, I saw that there was a gap and, and I know you and I have connected so much on craft and that's one thing that I'm really grateful for. Um, because I can now refer people to, Hey, there is something that's been proven to really help and it's designed for you. Like this is a program for you. It's not for your family member who's suffering. It is for you. So you can fill your tank back up, be in the best position to support your loved one, but you're taking care of yourself. And and that to me is just as important as supporting the person, the addiction community. Yeah. Alex, all of your points are very well taken. We know that the majority of people who end up getting into a residential treatment program report that the single influence that got them there was their family or their close friends. Yep. And so we know that family and friends and the social support network can have a lot of influences on people with addiction to help them find appropriate and quality treatment and benefit from it. You got it. Yeah. So, Alex, uh, in, I will say I will also join with you on the family bandwagon myself. I've been a clinical social worker for several decades, and I've always been drawn to addiction, first off with the patients, but then really early on in my career with families who were yeah. struggling with them. So when I decided to go into coaching several years ago, I saw families as being really in need and not having many professional evidence-based type of supports out there that they could benefit from. So that's why I work with families now. I've got to say that it's so rewarding, especially using craft. We find that when we train and educate families on a non-stigmatizing language, for example, and how to understand dual diagnosis, not only do the families recover, but their loved ones, people with addiction, they tend to do uh, really well getting into treatment and getting into recovery oftentimes. Yeah, you're 100% right. And it's interesting, Patrick, you just mentioned one of the first things that I struggled with was the language. I, all I ever heard was people refer to themselves and other people as addicts. And I, I never thought twice about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and then I started doing my research and I and I was like, wait, like you don't call someone like with cancer, oh, you're a cancer, right? It's like so negative. Um, so one of the actual first resources that I published after speaking to the community, and doing a lot of research was publishing a resource on like uh, terminology, like what is cool to say and what you should probably stay away from, um, which is on the website right now. But it just goes to show you like what role like our language can play in the stigma um, yeah. that that exists. And even having family members just sort of like take a little bit of time to like find that good balance of like do what's appropriate for your family member, but try to educate yourself. Like, you know, people often ask me like, what do you see the role of a family member um, in this space? And to me is it's, you know, most important thing is they know, and you told me it's not your fault. It's not their fault. Like it, this isn't a a them thing. And they need to know that no matter how many times they hear it, it's always good to hear again. But I think the most important thing that someone can do, um, being a family member, a friend of of someone suffering from addiction, is be educated. 
that's all you can do, right? Like all you can do is stand by and support them and be educated, whether that's, oh, hey, I know craft exists and I might want to leverage that for me and my the rest of my family. Or, hey, um, I know my loved one really well and hey, I, I should know that there are other recovery programs uh, and recovery groups besides 12 Steps. There's Recovery Dharma and Women for Sobriety and Smart Recovery. Like just giving your loved one the options um, yeah, and you choices. being educated. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. It's not a one size fits all approach. That's something that I so wish I knew before. Like I wish I could tell my friend, hey, like you have so many options and there's no one right way to go about things. But I think if a family member could take the time to be educated again, no one's ever perfect and there's so much to learn. Um, But if you take the time to learn sort of the space just a little bit, you can equip your loved one with feeling like they don't have to have like the world uh, and carry it on their shoulder by themselves and that they're alone in this. So I think that that's a, a cool role that a family member can fill and, and craft certainly helps with those skills as well. Right. And Alex, if you could give only one piece of advice to families with addiction, what would that be? I'd say to be patient with yourself, be be loving, right? Like be empathetic. Uh, there is so much uh, blame. There's so much shame and that goes in and out, right? That goes, there's so much blame and shame that you've done a really bad job as a parent and somehow this is your fault and it's embarrassing. Um, and there's also blame and shame because either you like shame your son or daughter or whatever, or you just feel like they're not doing enough and they're not trying like try to be as empathetic as possible. No one will ever tell you, I mean, maybe they will, but I haven't run into that person as of, as of yet that like someone being cruel to them, family members leaving them was ultimately what got them into recovery. Um, it's, it's the love and support knowing that they still had people, they still had their loved ones uh, around who were willing to like be patient with them and stand by them. That that is that's that's human nature, right? Like no one's going to want to feel like they can beat the world and conquer something like addiction, which is so difficult alone. Like I'm sorry, that's just not it's not a good approach. The way that the current um, environment is structured has made people feel like that's the only option. You got to be hard. You got to be mean. You got to be you know the tough love, which doesn't exist. You yeah. know. You just, you just got to, you got to know you, you got to know what your limits are um, and educate yourself as much as possible. So that way you just feel like you're, you're well positioning yourself, taking care of yourself and also taking care of your loved one. Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying be patient, be loving and become educated. Yep, exactly. I couldn't agree more. And that is an inspiration for me to take away with me today. Alex, I want to share that I have no doubt that your friend Reed is looking down on you and is just so proud of what you're doing. Obviously, she feels remembered. She feels loved. And as we know, when people feel loved, they're capable of amazing feats. A hundred percent. And and that's all that, that matters at the end of the day is like, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Everyone has their own vices, but there's, you know, in honor of National Recovery Month, there's no such thing as someone who can't come back from, um, you know, being in the throes of addiction and, and knowing that there's hope out there, that family and friends can b- stand by you and support you and that you have options and can go about recovery in so many ways. Um, I certainly hope that inspires people to find whatever recovery journey works best for them. Alex, thank you so much for sharing your inspirational life journey with us today. Please let us know how we can contact you and also how we can keep aware of the ongoing activities of the Albertus Project. Yeah, no, that's awesome, Patrick. Well, thanks for having me on first off. This is a real pleasure. I love chatting with you as always. Um, In terms of how folks can find us, we're at Albertus Project everywhere. Uh, Go to albertusproject.org. We run 100% on donations, so everything that you're, you know, someone's able to provide, I always say $5 can help one person, and that can provide medication for the day. That can help with half of their ride to their treatment center. So anything that uh, you know, folks can do to help support so we can continue helping the addiction community uh, means the world. And we're always open to different suggestions. If someone knows of a way that we can help or get in touch with someone, definitely reach out. We're, we're always here, so I appreciate it. Absolutely. So it's albertasproject.org. You got it.
Okay. Well, Alex, thank you again and have a wonderful rest of the day. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. That brings us to the end of this episode. As always, thanks for listening to Family Addiction Coaching. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And if you found this episode helpful, please ask two friends to give it a listen. Be sure to come back for the next Pro Tips episode. For more insider information you won't get anywhere else, and check out the other episodes. Until then, this is Patrick Doyle, and you can find me at FamilyAddictionCoach.com. 